All right, everybody, uh, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Tonight, we're going to study another sutta. Uh, we are still in the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. Tonight, we're going to be looking at sutta number 59, the Bahu Vedaniya Sutta. The, the many kinds of sensations, the many kind of vedana. So that's going to be our sutta for tonight. Um, I suppose one thing I'll mention from the beginning is that I've actually already taught this sutra one time before, uh, many years ago. In fact, it was about four years ago, and it was one of, if not my first uh, online video uh so many years ago so um but you know a lot of time has passed since then so i figured you know since we were in the middle of this section of the majima nikaya i thought let's let's just do this one again the reason why i did it four years ago is it's a really important sutta it's a really great teaching um, so I'm kind of excited to look at it again from a slightly different angle. Um, let's just dive in so we can kind of get started with the topic. Um, this is a, one of those beautiful suttas that has a lot of layers. There's like a lot of different things going on with this one. So <clears throat> um, let's just start from the beginning, but then we'll we'll see how we go. So the Bahu Vedaniya Sutta, the many kinds of Vedana or sensations, goes a little something like this. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. Then the householder carpenter Panchakanga went to the venerable Udayin, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and asked him, Venerable Sir, how many kinds of Vedana, of sensations or feelings, have been stated by the Blessed One? Three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One, householder. Sukha Vedana, pleasant feelings, dukkha, vedana, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant feelings. These three kinds of vedana, of feelings, have been stated by the Blessed One. Not three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One, Venerable Udayin, Two kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One. Sukha Vedana and Dukkha Vedana. Pleasant feelings and painful feelings. This neither painful nor pleasant feeling has been stated by the Blessed One as a peaceful and sublime kind of pleasure. A second time and a third time, the Venerable Udayin stated his position, and a second time and a third time, the carpenter Panchatkanga stated his. But the Venerable Udayin could not convince the carpenter Panchakanga, nor could the carpenter Panchakanga convince the Venerable Udayin. The Venerable Ananda heard their conversation. Then he went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and reported to the Blessed One the entire conversation between the Venerable Udayin and the carpenter Panchatkanga. When he had finished, the Blessed One told the Venerable Ananda, Ananda, it was actually a true presentation that the carpenter Panchakanga would not accept from the Venerable Udayin. And it was actually a true presentation that Udayin would not accept from the carpenter Panchakanga. I've stated 
that there's two kinds of feelings in one presentation. I've stated three kinds of feeling in another presentation. I've stated five kinds of feeling in yet another presentation. I've stated six kinds of feeling in another presentation. I've stated that there's 18 kinds of feeling in another presentation. I've stated that there's 36 kinds of feeling in another presentation. And I've stated 108 kinds of feeling in another presentation. This is how the Dhamma, this is how the Dharma has been shown by me in many different presentations. All right, let's pause there. Let's kind of chat about the kind of what's going on here. So there's sort of like two things going on, of course. One thing that's going on is sort of the topic of sensations or feelings, vedana. So that's one obvious topic that's the sutra is going to, you know, that this sutra is about. It's the title of it, all the kinds of vedana. But then you'll notice that there's another thing going on, which is this argument between a householder and a monk, right? And so let's first kind of just talk about their initial conversation, and this will kind of get us going into talking about Vedana. But then I want to come back to like this idea of them having an argument about this, even though they're both right. Or are they both wrong? <laughs> so let's start by analyzing the basic topic. So really quickly, and I kind of wanted to make sure everybody was sort of aware of this. I, I'm pretty sure everybody here is, but just to make sure, and then for posterity. So I want to make sure that everybody kind of knows or is is you know, again, aware that, you know, when we're talking about this Vedana, this topic of sensations or feelings, I want to make sure that everybody remembers we're talking about the second foundation of mindfulness. And just in case, you know, people, you know, somebody out there is not fully familiar with that, I think the the sutta will make a lot, mm, not that it will make more sense, but you'll get a lot more out of it if you know that this is like the second foundation of mindfulness. So when we talk about Buddhism, we talk about meditation, right? But of course, meditation is kind of an English Western word or idea. Normally, you hear more about mindfulness in the kind of Buddhist circles. Yeah, of course we use the word meditation, but we are par more partial to this, <clears throat> to this term mindfulness. So mindfulness, <clears throat> being full of mind, is this idea of being focused, being stable versus kind of all over the place, right? <clears throat> so that's the idea excuse me so that's the idea of concentration or focus or mindfulness but how do you do that how do you how do you become focused concentrated and mindful well there's a technique in the world of buddhism that's called well in pali so in the language used in these suttas it's the word sati. In Sanskrit, that word is smrti. And I always think it's interesting to, <clears throat> to mention that that word, the word that's being translated as mindfulness, I always think it's interesting that that word actually means to remember, to recall. That's actually what that word is and you know in traditional kind of indian philosophy you have the idea of shruta shrutam 
Shruta is hearing. And Shruta is like when you're when you're hearing a Dharma lesson, when you're hearing a teaching. So that's Shruta or Shrutam is to hear. And then later on, if you were to reflect upon what you heard, that would be Shmirtam. That would be Shmirti. A, a remembering in that way, or a recalling. Now, what's interesting, though, is that the Buddha or Buddhism uses that word of remembering to refer to meditation or focus or concentration. And what I think is interesting about that, and I, I've, I've used this example with many of my students, but <clears throat> if I were to ask you, uh, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Now, <clears throat> if you really notice your mind, you'll notice that in order for you to remember or recall what you had for breakfast, there's a moment <clears throat> where you have to like focus. You kind of have to like shut out the world for a moment. And I mean, if you really think about it, like really look at what your mind is doing when you're trying to remember something, you'll notice that you kind of go into a little quick meditation in a way. So that's shmurti, that that focused, mindful recollection. But what's interesting is that in the world of Buddhist meditation, we're not trying to remember the past. We're remembering the present. Very interesting to apply that same mechanism of mind, but to the present. So that's the idea of sati or shmurti. And in the world of Buddhism, what you do is, is that you begin by remembering the body. Like, remember that you're in a body. <laughs> remember. And what this means is, is that you come into bodily awareness. Your mind might, your mind might have been swimming around in all kinds of things and ideas and plans and what have you. But then to be mindful of the body. So this is kaya sati, right? So mindfulness of the body is coming into this bodily awareness and making that bodily awareness the focus of your concentration. That's the first step. After you have established mindful awareness of the body, and there's levels to that mindfulness of the body, by the way. But once you've established that mindfulness on the body, you can move to the second foundation of mindfulness. Mindfulness of Vedana. Mindfulness of sensations. So that brings us to our conversation between Panchakanga and Udayin. And so since the Buddha suggested that the second foundation of mindfulness should be awareness or remembrance of Vedana. What did he mean by that? <laughs> well, according to both Panchakanga and Udayin, the Buddha put sensations into at least two categories, <clears throat> and that's the category of Sukha and Dukkha, pleasant and painful sensations. Now, Udayin, the monastic, the monk, he throws in there a third category of a sensation, which is a nine, neither painful nor pleasant, kind of a neutral sensation in that way. In any event, the idea is, is that 
at the most basic level, and in this sutta, the most basic level is going to be two. <laughs> Pleasant or painful. And so what that would mean is that after coming in to bodily awareness, the first foundation of mindfulness, if you were panchakanga, it would mean then moving your attention to whether the body feels pleased or is in pain or you're, you are not pleased. <laughs> Are you having a good bodily experience or are you having a negative, painful bodily experience? Now, in either way, in either case, the Buddhist suggestion would be to just observe that it is the case that you are feeling pleasant in your body or that you're feeling discomfort or pain in your body. But the goal would be to sort of observe it notice it, potentially even notice where in the body is most painful or where in the body is most pleasant in that way. Sort of trying to notice where or what is this pleasant feeling or painful feeling in that way. Now, really quickly, because I pr will probably forget once a meditator has established their mindfulness or their recollection on vedana, the sensations or the feeling, then the meditator could move their attention to chitta, the mind. Now, the mind is coming out of the experience of the body. <laughs> In other words, your chitta or your state of mind might be not pleased. Not, I'm not in a very good state of mind. But you would realize, but I'm not in a good state of mind because of this painful sensation of the body. Or you might notice that you're feeling a little blissed out, feeling a little kind of just wavy gravy, feeling really nice in that way. And then your chitta, this, this sort of pleasant state of mind, you would realize, oh, it's arising from a pleasant state of the body, a pleasant sensation of the body in that way. Now, if you are a really skilled meditator, you could then go on to the fourth foundation of mindfulness, which are dharmas the very principles governing thought, the very laws and principles, the dharmas that are dictating thought arising from bodily sensations, you can actually be mindfully aware of the very mechanisms of the mind. But you could only get there from awareness of the mind itself, from sensations which are coming from the body in that way. <clears throat> so that's our quick uh, four foundations of mindfulness. The rest of the evening, though, we're just focused on the second foundation of mindfulness. So what we're doing, <clears throat> excuse me, what we're doing again is we are being aware of the body, but Specifically, in this case, we're being aware of sensations. And I want to kind of remind you that in the world of Buddhism, they talk a lot about this polarity between sukha and dukkha. Now, this idea of pleasant or even blissful sukha, right? So the idea here is, is this, this sutra is actually going to have a lot to do with this idea of pleasure or being pleased in that sense. Now, really quickly, before we kind of go on to the all the kinds of sensations, because I do want to go deeper into all of that, let's quickly kind of address Udayin's position. So Udayin, the monk, 
says there's three kind of sensations, the good kind, the bad kind, and a sort of neutral, neither here nor there kind. Now, for somebody like Udayin, he probably, and this is just speculation, but in the framework of there being three sensations, the idea of neither pleasant nor painful, it's usually described as like very neutral feelings that you really don't have any particular reaction to. You don't really want it to like <clears throat> continue. You're not clinging to it as a pleasant feeling that you want to last, but you're also not pushing it away as a painful feeling that you want to go away. It's just sort of a feeling. It's kind of neutral in that way. But interestingly, Panchakanga says, no, 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 no. That third one, the neither painful nor pleasant, that's, that's not a Vedana. And that's because this neither painful nor pleasant Vedana has been stated by the Buddha as being a peaceful and sublime kind of pleasure. Now, I do want to mention what, what Panchakanga, because remember, the Buddha said Panchakanga was giving a right presentation. Like, he's not wrong. So <clears throat> what he seems to be referring to, and the, the Buddha, by the way, is going to back him up on this, but that seems to be referring to a kind of equanimity, neither painful nor pleasant. No, that's what the Buddha called the sweet spot, the sweet spot of equanimity. That's a special place there, actually, when, when the mind is not clinging and holding on, nor pushing away. When the mind is actually equanimous and neutral, according to Panchakanga, the householder, the Buddha said that's a peaceful, sublime kind of pleasure. All right. So we're going to get back to the quarreling, to the argument. We're going to get back to all of that. But I do, because it's very interesting, I do want to kind of deal with the 5, 6, 18, 36, and 108 kinds of feelings. So really quickly, <clears throat> we know about the two kinds of feelings now, good and bad, or sukha and dukkha. We know now about the three kinds of feelings. What about the five kinds of feelings, though? Well, the, and by the way, this is all in, you know, Bhikkhu Bodhi and Bhikkhu Nyanamoli's footnotes, but allow me to tell you, <clears throat> the Buddha sometimes teaches that there's five kinds of sensations. He basically says, yeah, there's bodily sensations, and there's mental sensations. Now, by the way, in some other suttas, in some other teachings, the Buddha describes there being two kinds of feelings. But it's not positive negative. It's feelings of the body and feelings of the mind. So in other words, you can have physical sensations or kind of feelings, like what we would normally call feelings, but mental sensations. All right, so that's an, another possible interpretation of there being two kinds of feelings. When we get to there being five kinds of feelings, oh yeah, Lloyd, please ask away so that I can address it if need be. Uh, Where'd you go? Where'd you go? Oh, Lloyd. We're coming, Lloyd. Oh, 
We're okay? Okay. So back to the five. This idea is that there's bodily and mental, but there's two kinds of bodily feelings. Bodily pleasure and bodily physical pain. But in the realm of the mind, we call that joy and grief. So there, again, there's physical pleasure and physical pain, but there's mental joy and mental grief. But the fifth kind of feeling is equanimity. That idea of that equanimous middle spot between joy and grief and pleasure and pain. All right, so that's when, when the Buddha teaches that there's five sensations. That's Those are the five. The Buddha also teaches, though, that there's six kinds of sensations. And of course, the six kinds of sensations are sensations of the eyes, sensations of the ears, of the nose, of the tongue, of the body, and sensations of the brain or mental faculty. Uh, sorry about that, everybody. Kind of saw that coming. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did too. And I, that's why I sort of, I don't know. I don't know how they they managed to unmute because it's locked down. But uh, I'm sorry, everyone. It was so, just a sensation for us. To yeah, it was a to. very strong sensation for me. Indeed, sir. We noticed the the sensation. We noticed that there's this mental anguish. It's like, oh, that's like terrible, right? <clears throat> so again, we just work it in. We work it into the practice, really. So, so that was a visual and I suppose auditory sensation, right? So those there. Um, by the way, this division of the senses into the six senses or the six kinds of sensations, that's a pretty standard description of them, by the way. Next up, though, are the 18 sensations. Now, the 18 kinds of sensations are going to be <clears throat> the six senses, so the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and brain, either in a state of pleasure, <laughs> in a state of not pleasure, or in a quantumous state. In other words, this is this is where you could really do some kind of vedana smriti or this kind of mindfulness of sensations. Because if you were going to be mindful of the 18 sensations, you would basically take an inventory and you would start with your eyes. And the question is, are these visible forms that I'm seeing, these shapes that I'm seeing, are they pleasing? Are they not pleasing? Or are they kind of neutral or kind of equal or equanimous in that way? Like, in other words, and what I'm looking at, is it bothering me or not bothering me? How about the sounds? Are there any loud, annoying sounds nearby? Are there, you know, uh, whatever it might be. So you take stock of your hearing and notice, is it pleasant, painful, or equanimous? Olfactory, you, you notice the smell in the room. You notice any lingering tastes in your mouth. You notice your bodily sensations proper, your physical, you know, body. And then you could bring your attention to your mental faculty. 
am I having in obtrusive thoughts that are bothering me, that are, are causing me pain in that way or mental grief in that way? So you would go through all six sensory organs and kind of take an inventory. And by the way, that's a really good technique, beginning with the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and brain, mental faculty. Oh, look, there we are being mindful of the mental faculty. Well, that leads us really nicely right to the third foundation of mindfulness, the mindfulness of chitta or states of mind. So notice that there's a like truly foundations being built when you're mindful of the body, sensations, it, it leads to awareness of mind and then eventually awareness of dharmas. How about the 36 kinds of sensations? <laughs> so the 36 kinds of sensations actually have a lot to do with this sutta. So the 36 different kinds of sensations are the 18 kinds of sensations we've just talked about. So sensations of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and brain in states of pleasure, states of pain, or equanimous states. So those 18, but then depending upon whether you're a householder or a renunciant. In other words, the visual pleasure of a householder is different than the visual pleasure of a renunciant. And the same goes for all six of the sensory organs and then their corresponding vedana or sensation. So this kind of becomes a subtle way of talking about panchakanga and udayin, because one's a householder, one's a monastic. But I also would quickly want to remind you that we are, we are in the section of the Majjhima Nikaya, the Gahapati Vaga, the householder section. And if you've been coming to Dharma doors for the last, oh, I don't know, eight or nine sessions, you'll know that all of these suttas have been dealing basically with converting householders and either getting householders to become Buddhist or getting householders to renounce being householders. So I want us to kind of just spend a quick moment acknowledging this interesting idea of the 36 sensations, which are really, again, just the 18 sensations, but which are different if you're a householder or a monastic. And the basic idea of that for, you know, just to put it very simply, you know, like, um, well, there's actually so many, so many to choose from, but the idea would be that like, let's say, I, well, I guess a simple way to put it, a very, very simple way to put it is this, a good time for a householder is different than a good time for a renunciant. And kind of what I mean by that is, is that, you know, you take something like, um, let me choose an example. Again, there's so many, but I'll, I'll use the example of uh, like uh, violent movies. So the idea of like action movies for a householder, if I were to catch a householder in the middle of watching like a, a violent action movie, if I were to ask them like, How's your visual uh, field sensation? They would probably say, I'm delighted. Like, this is fun. And if it was like, pow, 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 and I asked, how's your auditory realm? They would probably say, I'm having fun. This is, this is great. But if I were to then move over to the renunciant, the renunciant watching this violent, loud movie would probably not be having a pleasant feeling. The renunciant 
if they were in a like a quiet zendo, a quiet meditation hall with no visual stimulation and no auditory stimulation, they would probably say, ah, I'm having a pleasant visual experience, a pleasant audio experience. Whereas the householder might be bored, right? And be kind of unpleased with that situation. So the 36 kind of sensations there are interesting in terms of what is pleasant for one is not pleasant for the other. So, all right. Any questions until we get to the 108? <laughs> so way back when I first did this sutta, one of the reasons why I wanted to do it is because this is a very old reference to this magical number 108. In fact, in, in Buddhist literature, this is one of the earliest references I've ever found to the magic number 108. You, of course, you find the magic number 108 or 108. You find it a lot in, you know, Buddhist sutras and Buddhist texts. But it's interesting to hear at least from this sutra or this sutta, it's interesting to hear where we get that magical number from. So according to the footnotes, the Buddha talks about there being 108 kinds of sensations or Vedana because you take the 36 feelings that we just talked about, which are really the 18 feelings for householders and monastics. So you take the 36 kinds of feelings but those 36 feelings can be either in the past, in the present, or the future. So then, in other words, there can be the past pleasing feeling of being a householder watching a fun action movie. But then I renounced and I am presently a renunciant <laughs> and that's going to be different. So my present visual joy would be different than the past visual joy. And it might be different than the future visual joy as a householder or a renunciant and then a renunciant. So you start to get this kind of um, like mathematics or almost algebra of, of uh, sensations in that way. But again, what I really want to emphasize is that this is giving us ways to work with the second foundation of mindfulness. In other words, one very quick way of being mindful of sensations is to ask yourself, do I feel good or do I not feel good? You could also say, do I feel good? Do I feel not good? Or I, am I in this equanimous kind of sweet spot? But then you could get deeper and you could be like, you know what? My lower back is physically pain. I'm in pain. But you know what? It's been such a great day that mentally I'm joyful. <laughs> now that would be exercising or looking at the feelings in terms of there being five feelings meaning I was looking at the body and noticing it was painful, but looking at my mind and noticing it was joyful. Neither of which are equanimous, that, that fifth sensation, but that's okay. Or again, I could do the six sensations where I'm just sort of dissecting or deconstructing my experience into what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and then finally what I'm thinking about. Or you could analyze it further into those 18 kinds or further still into the 36 or further still into the 108. So, all right, that kind of closes up that paragraph about all the, the Bahu, the Bahu Vedaniya, the many kinds of Vedana. Any questions, ideas, thoughts about working with Vedana? that means. Oh, oh, no, please.
uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to express this, but no. um, just just looking at the two versus three, not all the many, many, many kinds. Um, the two, the three, pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant nor un unpleasant, which maybe could be neutral or maybe not. I'm not sure, but then the two, he's arguing that the reason there aren't three is because the third is some kind of other state like equanimity, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm confused because being equanimous is like a, it's like a, I mean, your back can hurt and you can be equanimous about the back. So it's like, it's not, it doesn't seem like equanimity is a Vedana. It seems like it's a mind state. That's a Panchakanga's position, that it's not a Vedana. That that third one is shouldn't be part of the conversation about Vedana. Uh, okay, but I thought he was saying, okay, so he's denying that there are feelings that are neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Yeah, he's saying, no, that's what the Buddha calls equanimity. Whereas Udayin is going to be basically saying, no, there's neutral uh, Vedana that are not enlightened, equanimous, upeksha in that way. Okay, I was making it more complicated. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> All right. So let's keep going with the with the sutra now, like the the actual uh, story or the the teaching in that way. So, oh, and by the way, in case I forget, the re the original reason why I taught this sutra and the one of the main reasons why I love this sutra is because it's an an excellent example of what is would what would be called upaya, this idea of skillful means. But the point is, is that I want us to notice that both Panchakanga and Udayin, the Buddha says, yeah, they were both giving correct presentations of the Dharma. Like they were both correct. But because they wouldn't accept what the other one was saying, they were wrong in that regard. And I love this sutra because it's a, it's um, you know, basically religions can be so dogmatic. We, we know this, we know this about religions. And so for this sutra to actually be about anti-dogma, like, no, it's not just that or just that. The Buddha's like, yeah, I, te I teach there's five, eight, 16, 108. How many do you want? Like, it's very, for me as a kind of a, you know, a student of religion in that way, it's so refreshing to have this anti-dogma versus a weird celebration of dogma, almost. So, anyways, I just wanted to really stress that, that I really appreciate this sutra for that. All right. Now, the Buddha goes on to say... When the Dharma has thus been shown by me in different presentations, it may be expected of those who will not concede, allow and accept what is well stated and well spoken by others. It shouldn't be a surprise that they will take to quarreling, brawling and disputing, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. But it may be expected of those who do concede, allow, and accept what is well stated and well spoken by others, that they will live in concord, with mutual appreciation, without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. And by the way, of course, this doesn't just go for buddhism it doesn't just go for like these teachings right i want i really would kind of encourage you to really look at that line about what was what is well stated 
for me that that's about i i often find myself uh, kind of saying something along the lines of um wisdom is wisdom and i don't care where it comes from who it comes from when it comes from <laughs> so in that way like for me it's just about the message not the messenger in that sense so i kind of take that away from a sutra like this all right so after the buddha deals with the quarreling it might seem it might seem that out of nowhere, the Buddha just launches into a discourse about the five gunya, the five chords. So section six, again, out of nowhere, he goes, Ananda, there are these five chords of sensual pleasure, the pancha gunya. What are the five? Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of craving. That's one of the chords. Sounds cognizable by the ear that are wished for, desired, agreeable, likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of clinging or craving. Odors cognizable by the ear, sorry, by the nose, apologies. Flavors cognizable by the tongue. Tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of craving. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. Now the pleasure and joy that arise dependent on these five chords of sensual pleasure are called kama, sensual pleasure. So let's deal with that really quickly. So these are these five gunya. A gunya is a cord, a rope. And what we would want to be kind of thinking about is that we would want to be thinking that, oh, right. The Buddha often talks about bandha, bondage. In fact, there's this word, it's a Sanskrit Pali word, bandha. But it's where we get the English word bound is from bandha, a binding. So the Buddha is always talking about the fact that we are trapped. We're seeking liberation. We're seeking freedom. But we're trapped. We are bound. And what are we bound by? Five cords, five ropes, five bandhas in that sense or they're called the five gunyas. So these, of course, are visual objects, sounds, smells, flavors, and tangible objects. But specifically, we're talking about sounds or smells or flavors that are basically capable of stirring up craving, capable of stirring up craving and then clinging and all of the rest in that way. So, you know, this is where I would kind of want to remind us of the kind of larger Buddhist idea or the larger Buddhist teaching, which is this relationship between craving and suffering in that way, right? That that's like the key, one of the key truths the, of the Four Noble Truths is recognizing that relationship. And, you know, I always think it's helpful to keep in mind that from a certain perspective, the Buddha or Buddhism kind of looks at us all as if we are addicted addicted to different things, 
some of us are addicted to this, some of us are addicted to that. But at the end of the day, we are all kind of addicted to sensual pleasures in a certain way. That's a kind of basic Buddhist teaching is that we are addicted. And my point about this is, is that if, if anybody out there, you know, struggles with addiction, you'll, you know that there's a vast difference between the thing that you are addicted to and the addiction. Like, that the addiction is its like own thing in that way. And Buddhism is actually very interested in that, that relationship, the, the needy, cravy, wanty relationship that addiction has with things, different things, right? It could be drugs, it could be food, it could be sex, it could be whatever. But there's the thing and then there's this addiction to the thing. And the idea here is, is that what the Buddha really recognized is that addictive behavior is truly kind of a, of a, a disease in that way. That's why the Buddha is called the great physician, because he cures this disease. But what I kind of want to point at, it's about these addictive behaviors. And what I mean is the, it's the, the irritability when I'm not getting what I want. It's the, the, the way that, you know, I wanted to remind everybody earlier when we were talking about dukkha, I wanted to remind everybody that, you know, the Buddha's definition of dukkha which we can find in the, you know, all throughout the sutras, right? But, you know, the Buddha says birth is suffering, illness is suffering, death is suffering, pain is suffering. But being associated with what is unpleasant is suffering. And being removed from what is pleasurable is suffering. And that's the kind of really kind of um, nasty one in that way, right? It would be one thing just to have this kind of addic uncontrollable addictive behavior, but it's the, when I don't have it, when I can't get it, or just the obsession that goes around it. And in other words, the reason why I wanted to bring up the kind of relationship with ideas of addiction is, you know, we have this, um, I mean, it's it's an outdated expression, I know, but I know not everybody out there is uh, as, as young as I am. But there's this expression in English that is called the monkey on your back, right? It's a classic old expression for an addiction. Well, you might as well call it a cord that you are all bound up by. So what I'm kind of getting at is really wanting us to look at, well, this idea of liberation, this idea of being free, right? Buddhism's talking about sovereignty, freedom, liberation. Well, what freedom from what? Freedom from craving. Freedom from needing, freedom from that desperate addiction. That's that's the liberty, like casting off those cords in that way. And I really kind of want to emphasize that, you know, from a Buddhist point of view, there's not really addicts and non-addicts. From the Buddhist point of view, we're all addicted. It's just addicted to different things. Now, not all of us, because there are enlightened beings out there, fortunately, but for most of us, we have these addictions. And what is important to notice is, is that it's like, notice how you behave when you don't get your thing. <laughs> That's all, just notice it in that sense. So, all right. Any questions about all of that? So 
I've been trying to figure this out. I just want to put this out there. I don't have answers here, but so there would really seem to be a connection between the carpenter Panchakunga, whose name means the five something. And I spent all afternoon trying to find out what a Kunga is in Pali, and I couldn't find it, find it. But it's interesting that the first part of that, our carpenter, the first part of his name is the is five. And then this becomes a discourse about the five gunya. I can't help but feel like there's a connection there, but I just can't give you anything more than that. But then I want, let's kind of finish up the, the sutra because it kind of goes back to Panchakanga's comment. So after the Buddha describes the five cords that are binding us to sensations in that way, the Buddha goes on to say, should anybody out there say that is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings can experience? I would, the Buddha says, I would not concede that to him. And why is that? Because there is another kind of pleasure loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, Abhiku enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought it is rapturous and with pleasure born of seclusion. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. All right. So I kind of alluded to this earlier. I alluded to this earlier when I was talking about how the pleasures of a householder would be different than the pleasures of a renunciant? Well, the basic idea is, is that the Buddha says, you know, these worldly pleasures that are all based upon seeing something, hearing, smelling, tasting, or touching something. The Buddha says, if, if anybody were to say, right, like um, whatever it is, right, um, whatever it might be. I was at this concert or I went to this whatever, or I went wherever. And they were like, and it was the best. It was the utmost pleasure. The Buddha is basically saying, should anybody say that that concert was the utmost pleasure? I would not, I would not agree. I would not concede that. I would say there's actually a pleasure more loftier than that. And that pleasure would be getting into the first jhana. <laughs> so this is what I was kind of alluding to again with the, that the pleasure of a renunciant is different than the pleasure of a householder. But it's also kind of, I feel like, my big dharma message. <laughs> my big dharma message that I, you've heard me say it a million times. It's actually that the, the Buddha wants us to be having a much much better time than we're having. We are having this really miserable time and the Buddha doesn't see it as being necessary. It is not necessary to be having such a bad time. It's just that our understanding of what pleasure is, it's a little misguided in that way. And it's misguided because it's dependent. Normally, we get pleasure from things. We can't just be pleased. The pleasure needs to come from a food or from a feeling or from an experience. It, it needs to come from something. That's the normal default mode way of seeking pleasure is from things. 
And that works up to a point until you can't get the thing anymore. The real problem is that if you've conditioned yourself to be pleased and have pleasure from something, if you've conditioned yourself like that, then not only when that thing is removed, not only are you not pleased, you don't know how to be pleased because your thing's gone and you've conditioned yourself to get pleasure from that thing. So when you're left without it, you're like, how could, how could I be happy? Well, the whole practice of Buddhism, the whole practice of the jhanas is about developing a greater, more lofty joy that comes from independence. Independence. It comes from not needing something. It's a complete reworking of the mind. It's a complete, you could think of it as a reconditioning. You could think of it as a deconditioning. But the point is, is that this first or the whole jhanic process that we, we just entered the first jhana, this is all about learning or again, cultivating a joy that is not dependent upon anything. In fact, as it always says in the first jhanic state, it always says the first jhana is rapturous with pleasure. And that pleasure, it comes from being secluded. It comes from being removed from your stuff. That's what I mean by the radical reversal. Now, really quickly, because we have the time... I do want to mention, because I've mentioned it a few times, but when we're talking about the jhanas, if, you, if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, you know these are stock paragraphs. These are stock phrases. So meaning the descriptions of the jhanas are always the same. And so the first jhana is always described as pleasurable, joyful, that joy is born of seclusion. And the first jhana has or is accompanied by, oops, sorry. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, it is accompanied by applied and sustained thought. I'm not a huge fan of the translation applied and sustained thought. So in the world of Buddhist psychology, there's two functions of mind. One function of mind is called vitarka. The other is called vichara. Vitarka is a kind of um, a looking around, kind of investigating, so to speak. But it's not um, investigating like inquisitively. It's a mode of mind that is that it has not settled on anything yet. It's a mind that is sort of looking around for something to settle on, but hasn't yet. And then that's vitarka. And vichara is actually focusing on something. I've been wanting to mention this for a long time. So I'm going to mention it right now because I don't know when else I ever would mention this. But this distinction that Buddhism makes between the mental faculty functioning with vitarka and vichara, it actually has very interesting parallels. And I don't normally do this. And all of you know, I don't normally do this, but that actually has interesting parallels with the left and right hemispheres of the brain. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, there's a lot of new, very new research on the two hemispheres of the brain. And the basic idea is that all kind of like developed mammalian brains in that way have these two hemispheres. And it seems that 
the the left hemisphere is very focused whereas the right hemisphere is very ambient and very um the the description that's often used is uh like a pigeon or a bird that is trying to find seed in the grass the one side of the bird's brain the right side of the brain is keeping a very ambient awareness for predators. So the, the one side of our brain is kind of aware, but not aware of anything particular. Whereas the left side of the bird's brain is the, the, the side that's going, that's not a seed, that's not a seed, that's not a seed, ooh, a seed. So the bird brain, which is our brain as well, one part of it is keeping this very focused attention on the seeds, while the other part is keeping this non-focused ambient awareness. And when I learned about that, I was like, that sounds a lot like the Buddhist description of vitarka and vichara. Interesting. I, I put it out there as, you know, just something interesting to think about. But the reason why I mention it is because in the second jhana, so now the Buddha says, should anybody say that the first jhana is the utmost pleasure and joy that, that beings could possibly experience? The Buddha says, I wouldn't actually say that. I wouldn't concede that to him. And why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the pleasure of the first jhana. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Well, here, Ananda, with the stilling of vitarka and the stilling of vichara, so with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure, but rapture and pleasure born of concentration, not seclusion this time, concentration. This is that other kind of pleasure loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. So the only basic difference between the first jhana and the second jhana is the shutting down, the stilling of vitarka and vichara. Now, if, 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 if what I was saying is kind of true regarding the hemispheres of the brain, then what's going on with the hemispheres of the brain in the second jhana? They're shutting down. And notice then the rapture and the pleasure is born of concentration. And that would be that when the mind stops worrying, right, in that way, but put, shuts down the mind that's looking out for the enemy, and also shuts down the mind that's searching for food, sex, or whatever, shutting those vitarka vichara down, one enters the second jhana, rapturous pleasure. But should anybody say of that, that that's the highest pleasure a human being or any being could experience? The Buddha says, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't go that far. And why? Because there's another kind of pleasure more loftier than that. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Well, here, Ananda, with the fading away as well of rapture, a bhikkhu abides in equanimity, mindful, fully aware, and still feeling pleasure with the body, 
they enter upon and abide in the third jhana. This is the state on account of which the noble ones say, one has a pleasant abiding, the one who has equanimity and who is mindful. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. So the third jhana is this equanimity, this very even keeledness. There's no more kind of rapture, the fading away of rapture, but there is this pleasure, a feeling of pleasure with the body. All right, so the third jhana is very equal, but pleasant of the body. Now, should anybody say that that's the highest pleasure that anybody could experience? The Buddha would not concede that. There's something higher. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Well, here, Ananda, with the complete surmounting, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Here, Ananda, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. So now we're at that highest kind of jhana form, this fourth jhana. Basically, this is where we get to this neither pleasant nor painful. This is what Panchat Kanga was talking about. This is where he was saying, no, Udayin, the Buddha says that neither pleasure nor pain is the fourth jhana. That's a very special kind of uh, state. It's not a Vedana. So now we kind of start to see the, the whole sutra coming full circle in that way. But, of course, if anybody should say that the fourth jhana is the highest pleasure possible, the Buddha would not agree. The Buddha would not concede that because there is a pleasure higher than that. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, with the complete disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base or the foundation of infinite space. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. Very quickly, I was saying at the very beginning of the Dharma talk that there's these four foundations of mindfulness, body, sensations that we've been talking about all night, Chitta, mind states, and then dharmas, the very principles governing mind states. Well, the idea here is, is that once the mind has been cultivated that way, and once the mind is actually attending to mind itself and actually attending to the dharmas themselves, a very interesting dharma a very interesting phenomena can become the focus or the foundation of one's mindfulness. And that's when one places one's mindfulness on space. And I always emphasize this. When the Buddhists are talking about space, they are not talking about outer space. <laughs> when the Buddhists are talking about space, they're talking about the space between things. You know, all the space. <laughs> now, what I like to kind of emphasize 
I, this is a very important thing about space. If you want to understand space in Buddhism, you have to understand that it seems like space is, is out, is out there. But then you might notice something. And what that is, is that if I'm talking about my hand, then the space is, is in, you know, it's everything that's not the hand, right? But if all of a sudden I mention my fingers, notice that this, the palm, is now space. Now there's no like actual uh, space, if you will. There's no actual dividing line between my finger and the palm. So what I want you to notice is that space is a dimension of consciousness. The mind determines what space is and what is not space. And so my emphasis is that space is not out there. It's the space between everything. But what those things are is dependent upon what your consciousness is about. So what I'm pointing at is a very subtle relationship between space and consciousness. You've seen me do this one before, which is that if there was no space between my hands, they would be one hand. In other words, they would be occupying the same space, but luckily there's space between them. So what I'm getting at is, is that what is space and what is not space? has always just been up to you anyways. So there's a way of kind of hacking the mind in, in these traditions, especially the Buddhist tradition, but there's a way of kind of hacking the mind and basically attending or meditating on just the space. But again, the space is everywhere, it's infinite. That's the realm of infinite space. So the mind can kind of slip in between everything, kind of. I'm speaking kind of poetically at this point. But the idea is, is that what just got described, which is the surmounting, right? That's the way it was described, the surmounting of all perceptions of form, the disappearance of perceptions of diversity, that's what I meant by my two hands, the perception of diversity. But overcoming the perception of diversity, because you're sliding right into the space zone. And that's called the first formless jhana. So the other four that we just talked about have form, but this is just space. But should anybody say that that infinite space realm that I just described, if anybody should say that that's the highest level of pleasure achievable, the Buddha would not agree. And what's that other kind of pleasure, Ananda, that's loftier than that? Well, here, Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite. A bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. So the reason why I make such a big deal of the relationship between space and consciousness is because when you recognize that consciousness sort of needs space in order to conceive of things which are not space, but I need the space to differentiate them. When I understand that consciousness is sort of resting on space, 
if I get rid of the space, it's just infinite consciousness. But it's not consciousness of anything. We, we're done with that. We've been done with that since, in a way, you know, the jhanas, or at least the fourth jhana in that way. So infinite consciousness results from removing the space. But if anybody said that that was the highest level of pleasure, the Buddha would not agree. And why? Because there's a higher pleasure than even that. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Well, here, Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there's nothing. A bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness, absolute nothingness. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. Now, because consciousness has not had anything to think about, the what I call the residual hum of consciousness subsides, and that's the base of Nothing. Total zero mental activity. But if anybody should say that that's the highest pleasure that anybody could reach, the Buddha would not agree because there's a higher, more loftier pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. Now, so that is, of course, this, I'm not even going to make an attempt to describe it. It's by, beyond perception or non-perception. So don't worry about it. <laughs> but should anybody say... That is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience. I would not concede that to him. And why is that? Oh, wait. Yeah, so why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here, Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the nirodha, the cessation of samya and vedana, the cessation of perception and sensation or feelings. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. Now that last one, the nirodha, the cessation of perception and vedana, so that, in the kind of early schools of Buddhism, as you can tell from the sutra, that's the highest, deepest meditative state that is sort of possible. And what is interesting about it from a Buddhist point of view is this cessation of perception and feelings just to put it really, really quickly, let's say, let's say we were to use our old friend, this one. Now, in my example of this one, I often talk about how maybe you had a little cute bunny rabbit as a child. And so, because you are perceiving a bunny rabbit, the vedana, the sensation, is a pl pleasant one, right? But it also might be that you were bit by an angry duck as a child. And so when you see the duck, it brings about a negative vedana. So what I want us to notice from a good Buddhist point of view, is that really interesting relationship between perception and sensation. In other words, how I feel about something 
is dependent upon what I think that thing is. So it's not just like there's things, I perceive them and I feel a way about that thing. No, you're doing the perceiving. You're the perceiver in that way. Again, maybe it's a rabbit, maybe it's a duck. And then from the way that you perceive, you feel a certain way. But what I'm trying to show you with this example is how conditioned perception and sensations are. Meaning that you, you even, even seeing a rabbit or a duck is a conditioned behavior. And then the way that you respond to it is a conditioned behavior. I'm mentioning all of this because from the Buddhist point of view, to reach the highest, deepest state of nirodha, the cessation of perception and sensation, it's not an end unto itself, like it's not the goal, but from early Buddhist uh, psychology, you needed to be able to get to this state in order to stop reinforcing your perception and sensation conditioning. If you don't take a break from perceiving wrongly and kind of overreacting, if you don't take a break from it, it's hard to ever get out from under it. So this is what we call, or what I call, the sort of um, samskara wipe, <laughs> like a memory wipe. It's a conditioning wipe. And you only get the wipe, the kind of reboot, by entering this cessation of perception and sensation. Now, it's possible, Ananda, that wanderers of other sects might say this. The recluse Gotama speaks of the cessation of perception and feeling, and he describes that as pleasure. What is this? How could this be? Wanderers of other sects who speak thus, they should be told. Friends, the Blessed One describes pleasure not only with reference to pleasant feelings. Rather, friends, the Tathagata describes as pleasure any kind of pleasure, wherever and in whatever way it's found. At least that's what the Blessed One said, and the Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So that little bit, this kind of idea of like, oh, and if people hear that, then they're going to call the Buddha out in saying, yeah, your, your, your cessation of feelings sure sounds like it has a lot of feelings, right? Like that's the critique. Your, your cessation of Vedana is being described as pleasurable. That sounds like a feeling. But the Buddha says, no, 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 no. I, I use pleasure to describe a lot of things. And if you read the footnote, the basic idea there is that from a Buddhist point of view, the absence of suffering is pleasure. So it's not pleasure from something in the way that I was describing earlier. It's actually pleasure from the removal in that way. That's one way of understanding the Buddha's kind of describing of that final meditation as being pleasurable. So, all right. Any last questions, comments, answers, ideas about all the many kinds of feelings? Yeah, Noe. Yes, thank you, Michael. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Something that came up with it earlier in that John of hearing and recalling, and it brought up the front the word resentment and <laughs> how when I listen to music, I get a melancholy, and then I go into something, and oh, 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 that was oh, I was so young, and I re-feel it again. 
So it's an interesting state uh, that this is also pointing to, to, you know. Ah, that would be one of the 108 feelings in terms of a, a past feeling of pleasure or. Yes, thank excellent. you so much. My pleasure, Noe. But yeah, a lot of good uh, advice for observing Vedana, observing our sensations. All right, everybody. So that does it for another sutta. I'll be back next Sunday night with another one. So I hope to see you then.